uh, about recording myself, but in any case, um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Professor Amy Smith. I'm one of the joint heads of departments of classics, um, the department, single department of classics at the University of Reading and curator of the Year Museum, which is over my shoulder at the back of the hallway. Um, this is a virtual hallway, just a photograph. Um, uh, like many people, I'm working from home. Our speaker today is not working from home and has to rush away promptly to home at 5.30. So we're going to end questions then. But we would have anyway, even if she didn't tell us about her daughter's rugby career. Um, so um, but, uh, on, on with the speaker. Um, we, it's our absolute delight to start our current um, Making Classics Better series. And I should give credit for that title to the speaker of today, actually, to Susan DC, who thankfully came up with it. But um, we're, we're delighted to welcome Professor Susan DC. Um, that's the first time I've said that. Um, it called her Professor, who, who I've known for a few years now, and I think came to my, my um, awareness all the way back in 97 with her co authored book on rape in antiquity. Um, and since then, has authored tons and tons and tons of stuff on myths and especially gods, um, uh, not least as series editor of the Gods and Heroes of the Ancient World and the author of Athena for the series. And of course, I share um, with Susan a uh, love and admiration of Athena. Um, but for example, currently is in the middle of a five year project working on autism and classical myth as part of the Warsaw based ERC funded our mythical childhood project on the reception of classical antiquity and children's and young adults culture in response to regional and global challenges. And I know there's a couple of other members of that network out there too, um, who joined us for today's meeting. Um, but uh, in, in her, for her day job, <laughs> Susan DC is a professor of classics at Roehampton. Um, she's also taught at Vienna, well, we have at least one person from Vienna here with us today, um, Wales, Kiel, Leeds and Manchester and is a national teaching fellow and a principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy, um, which all gives her extra qualifications for speaking about pedagogy actually today. Um, she's very much driven by doing classics differently, however one might define differently, and reaching out to as many audiences as possible, which she has done both with her teaching and her writing and her special research projects, um, including this one. So without um, more hesitation, uh, before I have hand over to um, Susan DC, who's already sharing her screen with us, which is great, um, I just want to caution you all to uh, maybe turn off your audio and video so we can um, maximize uh, the bandwidth for hearing and um, seeing Susan. And if you are interested in um, commenting, uh, especially asking questions, we welcome your putting them into the chat and I'll get to them in, in a Q&A after the presentation. Um, or you can put up your hands, a virtual hand, a little yellow hand, I think it's the third link from the left. Um, and I would be happy to call on you again after our presentation is over and done with. So thank you very much. Uh, and now over to Susan. Love to hear what you have to say about autism today, Susan. Thank you. Oh my God, thank you so much. Um, just one thing, am I already sharing screen? Did you say that? Yes, you are. I see. Well, I was, I was yeah, I was going to go in suddenly at a particular point, but that's fine. It can just stay there now. I'm not going to turn it off just in case I can't work out how to go in again. Um, so this is a, yeah, this is only the second time I've been on this particular platform. Um, and um, the other time was uh, was also at something at Reading. Um, so let me just say to begin with, I'm so happy to um, to be, well, you know, here at Roehampton, but talking to you um, at Reading and obviously, obviously many people um, uh, from other places as, as well, as I can see very, very clearly here. So this is all um, really nicely national and international. Um, but I just wanted to start by saying that um, I think Reading, including the Yule Museum, um, is a really special place. So it's lovely to see that the Yule Museum um, backdrop here. Um, for instance, um, a few years ago, I took part in a well in-person event um, in the classics um, department at Reading. Um, 
which was very much on it was very much doing something that's not sort of out of line with what we're doing here um today it was thinking about how um how you know classics can have, well how, how classics can be can be used um in order to um you know make a difference and exactly as amy said you know how we define difference here is um is really really interesting and very relevant to what i want to what i want to talk about today um and i've also had um uh some really amazing conversations with um people at the your museum about various things including the the planned um queer trails which sounds um <laughs> incredibly exciting um and um and just to say that i um i need oh yeah and i also already mentioned tonight um oh no amy already mentioned um, and I was saying to the people who were here early on that I do <laughs> I do need to leave by, by 5.30 um, in order to get my daughter to uh, rugby in a park in, in Guildford because we're not allowed to, we're not allowed to car share. So, you know, if I don't get there, she can't do her rugby training. So there we are. Um, but, I mean, you know, it should be fine to stay until 5.30. I'm just letting people know because it's so nice to just sort of stay and chat afterwards. But sadly, I won't. Um, I won't be able to. Um, but, you know, it would be so nice if we can all meet at Roehampton at Reading or somewhere in person for coffee, wine, etc. At some point, that would be amazing. Um, so, um, so I'm really happy to be here um, because, you know, it's Reading um, and also um, because of the topic of this um, summer seminar series, uh, making um, making classics better. Um, where from a, a range of perspectives, various people, including some people who I think are, are here today, um, are going to uh, are trying to, you know, are, are here to discuss different ways of, you know, doing classics differently to make a difference in all sorts of different levels. That word again, difference. Um, uh, and one of the focuses I'm sort of spotting here in what people are going to be talking about is how academics. Um, um, and most of us here are, I guess, academics, um, how academics engage with people beyond the academy. Um, um, and what I'm going to be talking about um, this afternoon is a project I've been building up for a while now, in fact, since 2008, um, on autism and, and classical myth. Um, so it's something that I've been developing for some time. Um, there are times when things went a bit slow, went a bit silent, uh, when a bit silent, um, there have been times where there's been a flurry of activity, and one of those times when there have been a, there's been a flurry of activity is this month. Um, I do like marking months, weeks, days, that kind of thing, right? Such as LGBT History Month. That's where I was um, another time I was engaging with people at, at Reading. Um, Black History Month, um, Autism Awareness well day, week, and month. Um, you know, there are, I know there are all sorts of issues around this. And I'm very aware of these and very much engaging with them, such as like, you know, autism isn't just about one day, week or, um, or, or, or month. Um, but there's something about particular days and weeks, etc., that can really create a certain amount of energy um, that can then feed into things beyond that particular day, week or month. And so um, with the deadline of autism awareness um, week, which this, it's usually in early April. This year it, it ran from late March into early April. Um, with that date in mind, um, it gave me and various colleagues, including Katarzyna Marciniak, who's here, and Lisa Morris at Bar Ilan University in Israel, it gave us the impetus to um, do something we've been talking about for a while, which was to launch a, um, a network. Um, for people who are interested in um, autism and its interfaces with um, mythology. OK, so more on that in a, in a little bit. But this is so this this month is so we're coming towards the end of a month where there's been a lot of a lot of activity. And I'm trying to get it. And I hope to sort of share some of this with you and share some of the um, the energy here, including <laughs> my own energy. Um, so um, I decided um, I decided um, not to um, not to um, prepare a PowerPoint presentation. Sometimes when I say that kind of thing, people go, hooray. <laughs> um, because I mean, I've been surprised at how well um, PowerPoints have, have worked on, on Zoom, including in, in teaching and also when students do presentations. Um, but there's something also very nice <laughs> about not having them, um, not least because, you know, sometimes you then start talking to the PowerPoint rather than to the people. Um, 
So um, I'm not going to be showing a PowerPoint, but I am already you know, sharing something and I can share some other things um, as well with you um, that I regularly have open anyway on my computer. Um, one of the great things I suppose about being <laughs> um, doing, by doing things remotely rather than in person is that I can pick up things that are in my office. I wouldn't normally, well, I wouldn't be able to bring necessarily all the way to Reading, including, for example, my bucket here, right? My bucket of stuff that I um, that I use when I go into um, schools um, to work with autistic children. Um, and it's got I've got all sorts of stuff, right? All sorts of stuff, um, classics related. Um, uh, that, that, is, that is very much sort of linked with the key activities that I do. There's lots of stickers. Um, there's even there's even a sword <laughs> for freaks people that freaks people out um, um, to engage with um, what it is to um, make choices and, and and make choices successfully. <laughs> there's things like this. Um, there's also various minifigures. Okay, so anyway, more on that in due course. But um, uh, I'm also sorry. I'm pleased to be able to share stuff with you. Oh, so um, one thing I one thing I have thanks to um, thanks to um, uh, so, uh, thanks to something that I um, was inspired to do. Thanks to Zena Kamash, um, who does some amazing um, activities. Um, with people from Persian communities. Um, when she does her activities in places like cafes and um, cultural centres, that kind of thing, community groups, that kind of thing, she takes along a guest book, okay, because um, her university want, people, you know, want things like evaluations. Um, and um, people might not necessarily want to fill in an evaluation form, but they might want to write things in a guest book. Um, so inspired by that, um, and this is something I started in in Warsaw in a cafe run by um, autistic people. So autistic space, right, which is really, really appropriate. Um, I started the guest book there um, and, and someone kindly translated it into into Polish for me. Um, and so what happens is what I do, I go along. Um, you know, leave my guest book somewhere and then people, you know, people put stuff in it and it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's amazing, right? Stick things in it, they write things in it. Um, and so obviously I can't, I can't, I can't bring along that, you know, I can't like hand that to you. Um, but, you know, I suppose you could put things in the chat that I could like cut and paste and put into the guest book later. Okay. So, um, so that might be, you know, a good. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so in favour of trying to turn things, turn negatives into a positive, right? So we can't all be in a room together, but we can make the most of the opportunities that um, platforms like this allow. Okay, um, and I'm finding Zoom chat very, very useful. Also, a lot of autistic people find um, Zoom chat, and I, I imagine also um, Teams chat really really helpful so um why not you know use this use this actively um so i have done some stuff um where i've gone into um a school um a school in um, wimbledon um in london um to do stuff with um children in that school's autism base um since lockdown i've done some things um via well via good old zoom um, and I'll be going into a school in, well, elsewhere in London to their autism base um, later this summer as well. So, um, so I'm doing a lot of stuff at the moment um, and, and the things I'm talking about here as well. Um, um, and Katarzyna Marciniak might be relieved to hear this. I'm going to feed into a book I'm writing for a series that she's the editor of, an Our Mythical Childhood series, um, a, a book that um, introduces and then presents a set of 10 lessons based on um, class, classical mythology for autistic children. So I'm trying them out and getting lots of feedback. If there's anybody here who'd like to see what I've done so far, um, uh, whether you're aut autistic or not autistic, um, I would absolutely love, 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 love to hear from you. I want as much um, you know, feedback as possible on, um, on what I'm doing. Um, so, um, so I've been um, so I've done things already, um, including um, going into schools. I did have an initial chat when I was last in Reading um, about doing something um, for autistic children um, at the Yore. Um, I would I would love to continue to have that discussion and, and see if we can do something there. I love your museum. I love the way it's so user friendly. 
and, and really sort of empowers people, whoever those people, whoever those people are. I mean, the stuff you, you present for children, for example, is I think is I think wonderful. Um, and um, so um, so it was, a, it was at this point I was going to say, and there's also this network acclaim, but I've already started sharing that. So this was um, this was um, launched during Autism um, Awareness Awareness Week, um, and um, there was a flurry of activity during that week, and we've and we've kept the momentum going. Um, there's two interviews up already, um, more on which in a, in a moment um, with members of the network, um, and. Um, uh, uh, another one will follow very very soon it's all pretty much good to go um so all all happening and, and also links to events uh, including one's one that's happening um uh next month um the uh, uh student on a placement with the project um is coordinating and there's also a link this is all it all gets very you know very circular here there's also a link to this event <laughs> um which uh, i'm very pleased to be able to do and i guess we can eventually share the recording via um via the um website as well um okay so um what I'm what I'm doing then, um, fitting in with what I've already I've already said, is creating a set of lessons for autistic for autistic children um, that are using classical myth. Um, I've been work I've been building this up for for quite a few years now. Um, it was a few years ago, actually, um, around about the time of um, one of the our mythical childhood in person meetings in in Warsaw that I decided on a. Um, Heraclean or Herculean um, focus. And I'll say more on, well, I'll say something about why that particular focus um, in due course. Um, I present, I developed and disseminated via a blog I've, I started a few years ago, um, an initial um, set of activities for autistic children back in February. I think it was February. It was definitely February, but I think it was February 20, 2018. Sorry, my sense of time, thanks to the, this year of, of pandemic, has like gone awry a bit. So I can never remember quite necessarily when things have happened. But a few years ago, um, I developed um, an initial set of activities. Um, and one of the things we're um, expected, if not required, to do for the um, by the, for the Our Mythical Child project, which is funded by the European Research Council, is to disseminate stuff very quickly, if not immediately. And this has an amazing fit um, with how I love love to do things, right? I love sharing uh, the whole sort of research process, um, uh, as well as you know the final the final um, the final product of things. Um, so I shared an initial set of um, activities um, a few years ago. Um, they were a bit mad and all over the place because I was trying out various different things um, and I've since um, uh, reworked them and streamlined them and made them more and made them more focused. OK, so the final things that are um, presented in the in the book that I'm very happy to share with anybody who'd like to see them um, will be more kind of streamlined and focused based on um, feedback I've had um, from various people, most importantly of all, you know, the children who've had a go at doing some of them. Um, so um and so like fitting with what's already been said um the the, the book i'm writing that the work i'm i'm doing on autism and, and classical myth including as part of the acclaim network um is very much part of the erc funded european research council funded our mythical childhood project um that's now in its um its fifth year of five um it's on um uh the, the role of classics in um, children and young adults culture and um, I'm doing various things for the for the project um, but the key thing I'm the key thing I'm doing is looking at um, the place of classics in specifically in autistic children's culture um, what I'll do now very briefly is explain um, how all this came about I know how I came about how I came to be interested in um, autism and classical myth. I mean, I say I've been interested in classical myth since since I was a child. Um, I didn't have a I didn't have a classical education. I didn't know what classical things were um, until I was um, given uh, Roger Lansling Green's Tales of the Greek Heroes, which I have over here, actually. Um, another thing one can do um, via, via Zoom that I couldn't do, I'd actually come to Reading unless I thought to pack it in advance. So I was given this book, 
which I have, still have here, um, by my grandfather. Um, he bought it secondhand from a, a jumble sale. Um, at a time when he'd um, he'd, he'd usually buy buy me um, Ina Blyton books, um, which you could do, which a lot of people in the in the seventies were given were were, were um, donating their Ina Blyton books from the fifties um, to jumble sales, um, and I guess because um, you know that generation who originally um, read them had grown up and Ina Blyton was falling out of favour, so he'd buy them cheaply and it made me a reader. Okay, and then um, I was a bit afraid of this book for a long time because I didn't know what does it mean. What are Greek heroes? What do these pictures mean? Um, but then when I finally, I don't know, read all the Blight and stuff he'd given me, I opened it and um, yeah, my life was never the same again. OK, so I, I, I don't think I'd be <laughs> a classicist if it wasn't for um, having received this this book. Um, and so um, it was myth that got me into classics um, and um, and um, and then uh, after uh, going to a, a university where I stayed for my PhD, um, where there was a where which, which had the best myth the best myth program that I could I could find right in the UK, um, it's myth that uh, it's myth and it's interfaces with pretty well everything right <laughs> religion gender reception blah 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 that has um, that has been uh, the key focus of everything I do um, as an academic <laughs> everything I do as a person. Um, and then, it, then um, in uh, 2008, and here's an instance where I can remember a date, I was at a meeting um, in a, a, a secondary school um, with um, a special needs teacher. And she um, and when she found out what I what I do, she mentioned to me something that has struck her and struck her colleagues, namely that um, when um, the autistic um, pupils she's working with um, do a, would do a module on um, mythology, which included some classical mythology. Um, they particularly engaged with it. Now, of course, they might have been engaged in other things, but they weren't communicating that they were um, necessarily engaging with it. But um, they engaged often with classical myth and were able to show that they were um, um, enjoying what they were studying. Um, and this piece of information really intrigued me it blew, and it blew me away. Um, so firstly, I wondered why that might be the case. And then I started to think, hang on, as a, you know, as, as, as someone who's um, who's uh, really interested in myth and really interested in how myth can touch people in so many in so many different ways, um, as it did me as a child. I wondered if there was something something I could do um, um, by way of, for example, creating creating resources or you know informing, um, contributing in some way to the to the whole um, discussion, maybe generating the the whole discussion. Um, and so um, I reached out to various people. Um, a complete novice didn't really know who to contact, but they would then put me in contact with other people. Um, I started, and I kept being told this is a good idea. Um, and various teachers I was speaking to would say things like, you know, we need we need resources. We love working with stories. Go for it. Um, and then in the early years, I um, did something that I wouldn't have thought of doing previously. I put myself forward to be um, a disability coordinator um, for my um, uh, um, faculty at Roehampton. Um, that's a role I've held on and off soon, and I, I love it. I'm so I'm currently on my door. It says Professor Susan DC, um, <laughs> Disability Coordinator, School of Humanities. That's me. That's what it says on my door. Not Professor of Classics. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's how I'm presented. Well, I, or I would be if anybody actually you know came to this office at the moment because we see people aren't really allowed in the building. Um, and um, and I did things like attend a drama therapy um, summer school at Roehampton. Um, uh, at a time when I was you know, really interested in the potential for um, um, drama and drama therapy um, as a way to um, work with autistic people. So I so I so I've done I've done, I've done I did various things over the years. Um, I started blogging in early 2009, um, not least because it would it would give me some focus. Um, and I wasn't sure quite where everything was going to go. Um, I felt very passionate about the topic. I was increasingly be um, becoming um, more and more deeply interested in in, in autism. Um, it was making just so much in, in life and in my family life, etc. So um, so much more. Um, it was making sense of so many different things for me on all sorts of on all sorts of levels. 
Um, so I started, I decided to start blogging in order to um, um, share uh, my progress. And I didn't quite know then what the progress was going to be, but I made it very clear at the very outset that um, I expected um, my postings to be sporadic from time to time. Um, and that was often the case, you know, sometimes a long time would go by between postings. And for a while, actually, it, it started to it started to morph from a, um, a blog very focused on autism to something on on disability and disability studies uh, more broadly. Um, um, and then sort of turned back to autism, but then very much informed with the wider disabilities um, engagement and, and quite where, you, where, where the boundaries should be drawn between autism and so many other what her conditions is um, is um, such a huge question anyway. Um, so uh, so yeah, so I've been doing it for um, for a while, but often with um, you know a combination of gaps um, and then bursts of activity. Um, and then things, um, and then things um, uh, changed very much um, in the build up to 2016 um, when um, the Our Mythical Childhood project started. Um, and, um, and when we put together the proposal to the ERC, um, very much under the leadership of Katarzyna Maciniak, who's here, um, uh, when we put that together, um, uh, we were coming at the, the, the whole question of um, what is the place of classics in children's culture from a, a range of different angles, um, uh, and one of which, um, the one you know I've been leading on, is an autistic one. Um, and so since 2013, uh, no, since 2016, sorry, um, um, the uh, amount of work I've been doing and the amount of blogging I've been doing has um, increased um, hugely. Um, and there are certainly times where I put out um, many, many postings um, very, very quickly, often around often around um, Autism Week in April or around um, the times when we've met um, in May in Warsaw, um, where I um, use that opportunity and reflect on all the energy there from an autistic um, point of view. Um, so one of the things that I've been thinking about since that meeting with a special needs teacher in 2008 is what is it about classical myth that um, engage that can engage um, autistic people that can engage an, aut an autistic imagination, for example. Um, now, one of the myths, right, myths in, in a certain sense um, it, uh, about autism, right, um, is that a myth in the sense that a lot of people um, believe, right, um, but that isn't necessarily true. Um, one of these myths is that autistic people don't have imaginations, right? Um, <laughs> they can, <laughs> they often do. Um, very often, autistic people love um, experiencing other worlds. Um, that can be done through myth, right? That, one, one space here can be myth, in classical myth. Um, it can be things like fantasy, um, video games. Okay, that's a that's a big one. Um, westerns as well, things like things like that. Um, there was one autistic academic I was speaking to who said that you know, and and he could re and he could really see the. He went from thinking so, uh, wondering like why myth? What is this? What is this classical myth? I know some Norse myth, but what is all this? He was thinking, hang on, that has a fit with the Westerns that um, I um, love and loved as a, as a child. And he'd particularly um, identified with, um, you know, the baddies in, in, in Westerns, um, the marginalised figures, the ones who are most interested to, to, to him. And, and he could really see the fit here with the monsters um, of classical myth and Hercules also, right, and for, for reasons I'll come on to in a little bit. Um, one of the reasons seems to be, I mean, obviously it's going to vary from, from person to person. Um, you know, there is no one, <laughs> um, uh, there's no one thing that is, that is, there's autism. This is like um, now cliched saying, when you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, yeah? Um, but one pattern is that um, people often like the fact of the structure, right? Okay, um, there are certain um, um, uh, uh, key facts about, about myths. All right, they can be challenged. <laughs> they can always be challenged, but there are certain things. There are certain sort of familiar structures, you know, such as twelve Olympian deities, um, twelve um, labors of, of Hercules, you know, that kind of that kind of thing. Um, um, but also, so there there is a lot of structure, but also anything goes. Okay, um, and there's 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 a, there's a potential for you know so many things to happen, even anything to happen. 
Um, uh, in, in classical myth, the rules of the everyday world don't need to apply. And that can be a sort. And so, so the everyday world, the rules of the everyday world that can be such a source of stress, anxiety, even trauma for autistic people don't need to apply. So there's some, so um, the space of classical myth can be um, can be very empowering. Um, and the activities that I'm um, developing are, um, amongst other things, trying to do two things. Um, one of the things they're trying to do is to deal with various sources of hardship that autistic children can face, um, including those that come from dealing with a world that's very much set up by and for um, non-autistic people. Right. So there's a, there's a lot of focus here on dealing with sources of, of hardship, but there's also a focus on creating space for autistic children to experience various situations. Right. Um, as autistic people. So it's about being autistic and um, and celebrating um, what it is to um, to be to be autistic and to experience um, emotions, things like choice making, meeting people, et cetera, et cetera, engaging with various um, issues um, as an autistic person. And um, as I've said, I'm doing this um, in particular um, in relation to um, the, well, the figure um, depicted here. If I hopefully, if I scroll down a bit, hopefully you'll let me. Look. Okay, oh, it's, okay, that's a bit stressful. So I'm, I'm, sh um, so I'm sharing the screen, and I want to. And unfortunately, oh no, it's done. It's, now it's moving. Okay, this time, this time of the day, my computer usually stresses me out by going a bit slow. <laughs> oh well. Um, so hopefully that <laughs> I've now scrolled down further than I meant to. Um, to a particular picture on which more on which more soon. Um, uh, the the line drawing here was actually done by someone who some of you at Reading <laughs> may well know. Um, it's someone who works um, very much in partnership with um, with Sonia Nevin, who has you know, extremely strong um, uh, Reading ties, um, and whose session here um, was the last time I you know did, did anything via uh, this particular platform and at Reading. Um, uh, the the line drawing that's been coloured in here is done by Steve Simons, right? Who who um, who provides the animations and illustrations for the um, Panoply Vase animation project, along with Sonia as the the ancient historian. Um, and so Sonia and Steve are <laughs> very 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 key to the Our Mythical Childhood project, um, and um, uh, the illustrations um, that I take into schools. Um, and that are going to be in the book have been done by Steve, by Steve Simons, including um, this one here. Um, so the key, the, right, so um, the key focus of the activities um, is the figure of Hercules. All right, okay. As a Hellenist, I usually say Heracles, but um, because I'm I'm taking a strong reception focus, all right, including with this artifact um, here, with this drawing here, which is um, Steve's high quality vector drawing. Um, from an 18th century chimney piece, which is actually just over here. Right? It's five minute walk, five minute walk away, right? Um, I'm on the edge of I'm, I'm in Digby Stewart College at Roehampton, um, right on the border here with Froval College. Um, and um, the centerpiece building of, of Froval College is Grove House. Um, a show at an 18, a beautiful 18th century um, neoclassical villa. Um, um, uh, one of whose rooms, one of whose 18th century rooms um, includes a, um, uh, well, includes a chimney piece panel depicting um, Hercules choosing between two rather different um, paths in, in life. Okay, and um, so there's a Hercules focus, but even more specifically, a focus on this particular um, artifact. Um, so, um, so the reason for picking Hercules, well, there's, there's several of them, but one, one is that um, Hercules is someone who can very much speak to what it is to be autistic. Now, I'm not seeking to diagnose a mythological figure here as autistic. Um, what I'm saying is that there are a number of, of, of traits that can, be, um, that can be pulled out of the many traits um, of, of Hercules and so many different sources um, that can speak to what it is to be autistic. Um, um, one thing I'd say here is that um, Hercules is someone for whom everything is hard. OK, um, he's um, he's ever experiencing his labours, his hardships. He's always having to learn the rules for how to do things, you know, defeat the Nemean lion, 
defeat the Hydra, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But no, and he, he manages each time. Right. OK. But no sooner has he learned the rules for a particular scenario that he then has to learn a completely different set of rules for the next thing that he encounters. Um, so he's always having to learn the world afresh. And, there's, and the and the um, and the fit here with what it is to be autistic is um, is very, very striking. Um, he's always someone who's very much at home in his own space. OK, where he can do things kind of on his own terms out in the wilds, where he can be very successful in a way no one else can. But then when he moves among people, um, things can go terribly wrong, um, including it very rather terribly wrong as where he kills various family members and the potential fit here with a, with a sort of like volcano effect um that you can have as an autistic person where everything is just so intense you're feeling so many different things at, at once too much information to quote um the campaign of that name by the national autistic society a few years ago and that can lead to the volcano effect okay one thing i just sometimes think is that the um, um the um, mountain that you can hopefully see here um if i'm still sharing screen okay um behind heracles um one thing i think of it is amongst other things think of it as a, as a volcano that could explode right i'm not sure that's not meant but it's just something else i often think i often think of and it helps me um and um um what the, the um Autistic academic I mentioned earlier, the one who um, used to really love Westerns, um, he was very, you know, he was very interested in, in finding out um, why I, um, why, why classic one with why Hercules. So what I did basically was to say the kind of things that I've just, um, I've just outlined about Hercules. And um, what he said, and this was quite a turning point for me and a very moving point for me, was he said, that sounds like being autistic. Um, and then when I've said comparable things to other autistic people, they've said, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's what it sounds like. So, uh, wow. Um, so there's a focus on on Hercules and more specifically Hercules at the crossroads. Um, this is where um, often when he's on the cusp of adulthood, um, Hercules is tasked to make a choice. All right. So there are um, there are some ancient sources here, ancient um, literary sources here. Um, including, well, Xenophon, Xenophon quoting Socrates, who's quoting Prodicus, right? So, um, might be might be authentically from Prodicus. But, um, but anyway, it's in Xenophon. There's also um, a, a version in, in um, Cicero and various other places as well. Um, and then, um, no surviving um, visual sources from antiquity. Maybe there never were any. Then there are no surviving ones. Um, but um, since the Renaissance, the choice of Hercules between two different figures who represent um, very different paths in life um, has been um, popular in art. You see it very much in the Renaissance and very, very much, not least in, in Britain um, in, the, um, in the 18th century, where it very much spoke to um, the concerns that 18th century people would often have between trying to strike the right balance between things like hard work and pleasure. All right. Um, so the women here in ancient terms, um, well, what is it, arete and kakia, right? often translated virtue and vice. In the 18th century, it's often um, not virtue and vice, but virtue and pleasure, yeah, which I very much like, um, um, uh, became, um, you know, became very, very sort of relevant um, in all sorts of ways. Um, and um, like I said just now, the key um, artefact that I'm focusing on for the um, activities is um, the, an 18th century chimney piece panel, right, in um, an 18th century neoclassical room at, um, at Roehampton um, uh, that uh, Steve Simons has done um, some amazing drawings for. Okay, You can see one of them here as coloured in by um, someone at one of the workshops I did, um, and I'll show you more of his drawings, and I'll also show you the, um, the chimney piece soon at least i i hope i will right oh good oh, it's working again I'm, I'm hopefully you just see me scroll back up um and so um what i'm gonna what i'm gonna one way to, i thought i could show you things um rather than trying to like have various documents all open in case it all went wrong with screen sharing on a platform i'm not familiar with it also always goes wrong i mean i think um at least one of the roehampton students was going to come here and hope is here and that's um that's lottie um and um as, as she, as she'll be able to confirm i i i, I, know, I'm, I, I still get everything all kind of wrong <laughs> 
I get overwhelmed when I'm trying to share things on, on Zoom when I'm trying to like talk and think and do practical things at the, at the same time. So it's no better on Zoom, but at least, um, you know, I feel a bit more um, familiar with it. So, um, so um, what I want to, oh, wait, you know, and if you're interested in, I hope this works, if you're interested in being one of our members, um, okay, it's just, it's just a bit slow in thinking here. Um, do let me know. I just I, this isn't key to what I want to say. I just wanted to like show you <laughs> show you um, our our members to date. All right, they don't quite look like that now. Um, but this would have been a nice class of people, wouldn't it? <laughs> nice classroom of, of people. Um, and, I, and if anyone wants to, me to explain why everyone here is a, is a child, I'll, 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 I can let, I can let you know. There is a there is a good reason that's very much at the at the core um, of the Our Mythical Childhood project. Um, and the way we, you know, engage amongst other things with our own um, memories of, of, of childhood, all right, and how we transitioned out of childhood and still engage with our childhoods. Um, but what I wanted to um, to take you to um, with the interviews, and so another thing that's been really um, uh, exciting um, over the last couple of months is that um, two students at Roehampton um, in humanities who were um, history students doing a historian at work module. Um, we're finding it hard to get placements because of um, COVID. Um, and so the module um, convener reached out to, to me to say, look, is there any possibility they could do something on your on your project? And I discussed it with Lisa Morris at bar and with Katagina and with other people involved in the in the project who all said, yes, we will find a way. And um, what's been great here is that we've been able to give an opportunity for the for the students to do remote presentations, um, sorry, remote placements um, between Roehampton and also Warsaw and um, and Barilan in Israel. Um, and um, so they've um, so, you know, uh, the sense I'm getting is that it, it, it's, it's, helped, it's helped them. Um, one of the students, for example, um, plans to um, become a teacher a history teacher, I assume, um, after he graduates, and he could and he could very much see um, the potential here for um, working, particularly on autism, um, um, autism and um, how autism is used in teaching um, uh, children. Well, thank you, Ali, <laughs> um, um, uh, to um, help his further career. Um, so, um, but so hopefully it's helped the it's helped the students. Um, and uh, but it's also helped the project, right? Um, the interviews, for example, that Adam, one of the students, has has done, um, have um, been amazing. Um, for example, the it's very interesting that sort of Cora Beth Fraser, oh, who is wonderful, um, some of the things that she raised in her interview, which was um, completely independently of mine, sort of fit really interesting is some of the things I was saying. So that's been that's been that's been an amazing moment. Um, th there will soon be a third um, interview coming up. Um, uh, it's all pretty much ready to go. So hopefully go live with that next week um, and then others after that. Um, but um, so Adam did one with me. I'm just going to make sure I click the right thing. Um, God, that was me talking well, in the days when you could talk in. That's, that was me talking in Warsaw a few a few years ago, where weirdly enough, I'm wearing the same jackets I'm wearing today. So I don't know what that means. Um, and um, but of course, I'm wearing smart trousers. Who knows what I'm wearing today? Oh, I did get up earlier. So you'd have seen, wouldn't you? Oh, well. um, and the reason why I. OK, look, so if you if you're if you're interested in finding out more about what I do, OK, I can easily you know share this link with you. Um, and um, and actually doing this interview really helped unlock something for me. I was finding introducing my book really hard. Really, I was finding it really really hard to pitch. Um, and um, and then um, but then when I started answering um, Adam's questions, it was really helping me turn a critical eye on what I do. Um, so one thing I've said to Adam, and I hope he knows I I, I actually mean it, is that um, uh, doing the interview with him has actually had a a very very um, uh, key impact on on my on my book, in, in, including in um, liberating me um, and get me get me out of the sort of um, being a bit stuck as I was. Um, so, um, but one of the, but anyway, so here, here's the here's the interview. Um, but you see, it, one reason for sharing it is that it enables me to show you some of Steve's um, Steve Simon's artwork. So he's done some um, drawings all based uh, based on. Um, um, uh, works of ancient or in some cases um, post-classical um, art um, that are Hercules related. Um, so the key focus is the choice of Hercules. Um, 
but I do that very much in relation to um, better better known stories of Hercules. And, and one reason why I'm really happy to make the focus, the choice of Hercules, is that it's a lesser known myth, right? It, no, it wasn't in the 18th century, but it is it is today. So it means nobody's advantaged or disadvantaged, okay? Whether autistic or not autistic, everybody's kind of you know on the same on the same page in terms of um, prior knowledge. Um, uh, and, uh, and in terms of whatever they're bringing, um, Heracles-wise or Hercules-wise. Um, but there will be um, a focus on comparing um, uh, what Heracles does as the great adventurer um, to what he does when he's stuck trying to make a decision, um, potentially feeling not so many emotions all at once that he um, has gone into sort of lockdown, um, shutdown, <laughs> lockdown. Um, so, um, so Steve has done various drawings, and here's here's one of them. Um, but what I wanted to so this is this is the chimney piece panel. Um, um, just like I said, just 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 over there, a couple of minutes um, walk away. Um, I I know at least some of you have been in that room. I can remember being in a in a meeting once with Catherine Harlow. Do you remember that? That's the session on a completely different subject. But I managed to use this artifact um, as a kind of metaphor for what we were doing there. Um, it's um it's a very very open um, um, uh, depiction, right? That um, and one thing that's been interesting is that whenever I have been talking about this artifact in the room or indeed um, outside the room, including via Steve's drawings, um, people have tended to like spot different things that that really speak to them. Um, and people have very much um, uh, interpreted it differently. When I was in the room once, for example, with a group of um, um, female students who were all um, about oh 15 or 16 at the time. Um, they were from. Um, it was when the university here were, were very much trying to sort of reach out to um, young women from the kind of backgrounds from which people don't tend to go to university, right? Um, and what was interesting was that um, oh, and they they come on campus for activities with all the departments. And when it was humanities turn, um, we went very sort of classics heavy um and um and uh one of the activities was in the adam room um and one thing that was interesting here was that um whereas you know when classicists look at this they'll see that the focus will be the man in the middle hercules um what the um what the um the young women focused on was not the man in the middle it was the women it was the women and the gestures they were making but also how they were each trying to make a play for the man uh, that, um, that they were particularly interested in. Um, and the same's actually been true of some of the primary school children I've, I've, I've worked with. It's the, it's the women that they're interested in. And they're, they're, they'll say things like, oh, one of them's trying to kiss Hercules, things like that. I think they want to marry him. Um, re really, really interesting things. And so that's really helped challenge amongst other things, you know, what I focus on here, because my eye does tend to be drawn to the man in the middle as someone who, you know, amongst other things, uh, is very interested in the academic study of Hercules, right? I've um, published on Hercules, for example, which is one reason why um, at a time when I hadn't long um, had uh, a chapter in a book published on Hercules, it was really weird to get to Roehampton to be in a staff training session in this showpiece room and realise Hercules was behind me. Um, so um, so anyway, so this is, this is here's a photograph um, uh, that was done by a colleague of, of mine who's also a photographer, um, um, uh, Marina Borevieva, um, and um, so that's one of her one of her um, photographs of the of the scene. And then um, and then S Steve has done um, a whole set of drawings. Now um, one thing he's done he's done a, a like an unclothed version, but also I haven't shown it here, but he's also done a clothed version. Right. Um, and fitting in with a uh, discussion I had, we had, I think it was when I was last via teams at, at Reading for Sonia's session and an interesting discussion about nudity and, and children. So for all sorts of reasons, including that some autistic people find nudity um, difficult, not all, but, but some do. Um, there's also a version um, that Steve has, has drawn um, amazingly. I'm happy, I'm, can have, I'm happy to share that with anyone um, where um, she's more clothed. Didn't have to do anything with her, <laughs> with a figure of virtue or hard work. Pleasure he did, and Hercules is is, is rather more clothed as well, in a in a very nicely um, classical way. It's really impressive what he did. And so, um, Steve has provided um, uh, a whole, uh, some drawings of the whole um, the whole scene, but also really interestingly, um, because this is such a because this is such a detail rich scene. Um, and one of the 
things that autistic people often deal with is right on one hand it can be really good attention to detail right so autistic people might zoom in on one particular thing here um but also there's a potential of just being overloaded right so i really wanted to engage here with how you know you can focus on particular things um how you can also get overloaded so there's a lot of focus on the on the different objects and so what steve has done is um drawings of um a range of the um particular uh, uh features of this very very rich crowded um potentially overpowering scene uh, there's more than this i just put together for, for you know, the interview with adam a few of them um just to get just as an illustration um all of them will be in the in the in the book and i'd love afterwards uh, to do a, a, a coloring book for children based on these all right or anyone <laughs> right coloring is such a thing that adults do now um so um might be good designs for tattoos as well <laughs> particularly this one maybe anyway i'm just saying um so um uh so that yeah so that's um uh some of the drawings i wanted to um i wanted to share with you so um 18th century representation that steve is in a very 21st century um drawing of um and um i'll just end by um uh, just saying just saying a few more things about what I'm particularly focusing on and also then how I structure the lessons then I'll then I will then I will stop um, uh, I, this this scene is one that um, I've already I've already tried to give a sense of why it's relevant including the whole sort of volcano effect thing um, lots of focus on details um, one of the things I'm focusing on in the activities is what it's like to be um, someone who um, as an autistic person um, finds entering new spaces um, very, very, can find entering new spaces very, very um, uh, difficult. Um, it can be very um, anxiety inducing, um, for instance. Um, so there's a strong focus on how this is very, very um, detail rich space. And I've, I've mentioned a few things, you know, I've there's a few illustrations here. There's a lot more that I could say here. So that's one thing, it's, it's entering new, new places. Um, another is making choices. Um, you know, obviously making choices can be hard for anybody, right? Um, but when you're autistic, um, that can go on to, on to a whole other level. Um, whether things are uh, big or small, right? Might just might not be might not be applicable because everything can be difficult. Making any kind of decision can be really really difficult. So one of the things that I engage with here is um, how to, uh, what it is to, to make choices, also causality, and that can be a really cha real challenge for a lot of autistic people, thinking about how the, um, the present can turn into the future, right? So not just making decisions, but also the um, implications that any choice you make might have on um, what happens next. Um, there's also a strong focus on something that is also very key to an autistic experience, namely emotions. Um, it's certainly not the case that <laughs> autistic people don't have emotions might have it they might find it difficult or they might not want to um, communicate them or sometimes they might feel things so strongly they communicate the wrong emotion yeah um so they might um they might respond with what looks like joy and happiness when they've been told some bad news right it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean they don't oops i just fell off my shelf it doesn't mean they don't they don't mean they get it they don't they, it doesn't mean they're not say feeling grief or something um it's just the um the emotions are uh the emotions called up are so intense that they show the wrong one um so um communicating and regulating emotions um can be can be a challenge um and um so what's going on here you know is 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 is, is Heracles so Hercules so um, so um, um, finding that the choice he needs to make so difficult um, that he's um, that he's feeling he's feeling so much he's gone into a, a kind of a kind of shutdown. Um, another great thing here is that there's no right answer or wrong answer. Um, in our earliest source, you know, Xenophon stroke Socrates stroke, stroke Prodicus, um, it's never said right what choice he actually made. OK, um, and um, and so one great thing is he here is that um, whichever um, choice we think Heracles made, Hercules made and how and how we might relate that to how we ourselves make choices and what we would choose between hard work and pleasure. There's no right answer or wrong answer. OK, so that's another thing I'm very much making use of um, in the activities. Um, so each of the lessons, right, just to make a very final point. Um, deals with a particular aspect of the of the episode. 
um, and also um, it deals with a particular aspect of what it is to, to be autistic. Um, the lessons fall into four, yeah, four parts. I, I always ideally like it when things fall into three because that's so neat, but it's four. Where the first is the first is one. It's very much inspired by um, one of the teachers I was um, working with at um, the school in Wimbledon, who would always start with a bucket, right? So I called it an amphora. Right, right now it's a linen basket. I bought in Asda, um, and um, and what she would do, she would um, this, and the kids would get so excited, she'd pick up a bucket. And inside the bucket, there would be one, two, three things that were going to be relevant to the activity that they were going to be doing. Um, and so um, that's something I've um, started doing, um, inspired by, by her. And I called it an amphora, not least because um, one of the um, artifacts, one of, one of the things uh, included in this very rich, um, this very rich um, picture is that, is an amphora. So it's also an, an other way to sort of engage directly with the scene. Um, so one is what's in the amphora. That's the first thing. Secondly, um, is a sort of talk about um, session uh, section where we talk about various aspects of, of, of Heracles and link that with various aspects of being autistic. Um, then there's a creative activity. All right. Often and surprisingly controversially include involving colouring. Um, I probably better not start going into that now, um, but. Um, the role that colouring in should have in autistic children's education turns out to be quite a controversial one. But um, um, anyway, um, so but I'm just saying I've, I've embraced it because, um, yeah, it, it, it works. Um, and, um, and I found that when people are colouring in, they start um, they start discussing things, they start um, engaging increasingly deeply with the scene and, 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 and how it speaks to their own identity. Um, so in the book, I do make a, a strong case for um, why colouring that's very much underpinned by the relevant literature. Um, so Amphora talk about then the creative activity um, and then do something kind of more complex um, around, for example, you know, discussing um, something that's come up that's relevant to the particular um, aspect of the episodes I'm talking about, for example, you know, discussing emotions, discussing um, the first time you, you went to a new place, um, for instance. Um, uh, the first time you started a new um, school, something like that, for example. Um, there are 10 lessons in total. Um, they can be done as a set, right? They could even be done as, like, as part of, say, a summer school, something like that. They can be done as a set or they can be done individually or um, they can be done in any order as well. So that's one, one of the things that's making it like quite a challenge to do um, because, you know, uh, and, and, the, and the fit potentially with social stories that are so um, key to autism pedagogy um, is, I think, quite strong um, because if, you know, so people can um, start from the point of view of, um, you know, let's have children learning about about classical myths and finding out about an interesting figure that they often really enjoy finding out about that can even speak to them. Um, but they can also, but you can also start very much from, um, you know, let's find a way to talk about um, entering new spaces. Let's find a way of talking about um, the present turning into the future, causality, um, choice making, emotions, that kind of thing. Um, so, oh, and also. Um, uh, another thing, um, and also fitting in very nicely <laughs> with what with Sonia's uh, session that I uh, 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 reading uh, last term, um, uh, there's also um, an animation that Steve has has done. So Steve, um, the artist, is is very much a, an animator, as a lot of you will a lot of you will know, um, and he has actually animated the choice of the choice of Hercules. OK, so that's another thing that um, I'm going to be very much um, making um, part of the um, um, activities. OK, so um, I'm sure I'm supposed to talk for less time than so I better. I better and as I said, I need to, I need to leave um, by about half past. So I'm going to I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop now. That's everything um, I kind of um, wanted to wanted to say. Um, and so I guess I. Oh, thank you, Matthew. So I guess I hand back to Amy now. Hello, Amy. <laughs> thank, uh, you. thank you so much, Susan, um, for such an uh, overwhelming um, um, display of erudition on on everything, and um, <laughs> for bringing us literally um, uh, through your window to Roehampton as well as to Poland. I'm sorry that Katarzyna has just left. Mm -hmm. and um, your generous invitation to help us all out. Can I just ask one one question that others might be asking, but 
in my um, uh, one of your many shout outs to the Year Museum. Thank you very much. I didn't pay for this. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you said um, um, that you're happy to work with us on, on reaching out to, to um, autistic, autistic communities or whatever. Um, if we if we want to take your range of um, classes, your your you know into the classroom. I mean, do we need you, or are you are you um, no. you know uh, somehow cloning yourself? How do how do we take you into the classroom? Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> no, that's, that's such a good point. Um, so 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 far it has been you know it has been me going into classrooms or doing things or doing things remotely needless to needless to say uh, not least because um i'm ever you know refining and developing the uh, the activities um but um but the uh, the the goal is that um that um the, the, okay the, the book is the, the lessons as presented in the book are very much presented for for teachers um, so that they can use them um, with uh, with their students. Um, and um, having having said that, I am you know I'm really really happy to um, to um, uh, you know do further do further activities. Um, and um, I, what I was gonna what I was gonna say, um, and again with someone who I think has a, a reading link. Um, uh, when I went into the school in, in Wimbledon, I did it with Effie Costara, um, who um, at that time was working as a, um, a she, I think she has previously lived in Reading, um, and she was um, uh, working as a research assistant actually for the for the autism project. Um, and, uh, and she was a great person to work with um, because she's someone who has a background in classical philology um, and now switched to sort of education. Um, and she's very interested in things like, you know, inclusive um, education. And so what she actually did, she she designed um, as part of this um, funding we got, she did, she designed a teacher's guide um, that fitted with the the first set of activities that I that I designed. And they were very much written with teachers in mind um, because we've um, sort of had so much feedback since. You know, I've done consultations, a consultation session, for example, um, with various um, people who are experts in aspects of, of autism um, and I've got feedback from them. We need to do a lot of refining, um, but um, uh, what we're hoping to do, um, and I'm discussing this with Effie very much at the moment, is to make that teacher's guide available via the Acclaim website um, pretty soon. So you don't know, I, you don't need to have me. And, it, and in fact, um, Roehampton would probably be really happy if you didn't have me, because then that would that would be impact, wouldn't it? Because other people would be would have been taking up what I'm doing, all right, and using it. So so maybe, but you know, but but I love doing it. <laughs> but they know that you're a highly impactful person anyway. Um, so talking about which, many people have already um, put in thanks and and um, comments in the chat, and um, Matthew um, Knight has added his drawing for your scrapbook for oh, your oh. Your book. Oh, thank you. Is it possible to um, every time? Actually, every time I every every time I turn my on my computer, the first thing that pops up, whether I like it or not, is the chat from the last session I was in. Um, oh. So presumably, um, the the chat just gets saved because, um, uh, or is someone else a, or or is anyone able to save it just in case? Yeah. You know, yeah. So, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll I, I've seen so much, so many exciting things coming up. Um, some of which I haven't had time to read yet. Um, well, but thank you. I'm trying to. It's, it's kind of my job to help help with that. I encourage yeah. Matthew to put his um his his drawing for your book in the in the chat. Um and and Claudina Romero Mayorga, our um, education officer at Eor, said um that she's excuse me um uh, very interested in developing finally developing a project with you that the year with or without you a virtual you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Bad time. <laughs> <laughs> um, all the devices go off at once. Um, do we have, I think we have um, someone's hand up in the audience. Um, it's Aaron Cox, who's one of our MA students. Would, it, would you like to talk, Aaron, please? Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Hello, that was a really good talk. I quite enjoyed it. Um, I was going to ask, actually, um, whether or not, I've, I've got an autistic child myself, and he has 
been quite remarkable in explaining to me now this might be a bit of a roundabout way of going about things but um he has a fascination with um godzilla basically and now he can list to me every single type of godzilla from you know he calls them like legendary godzilla down to like the 1960s and can tell me every single one of them and their heights uh, do you find that sort of autistic people generally are g well placed to sort of manage the various interpretations of mythological figures? You know, is is that something you've found yourself as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. That that fits. That totally fits. Yes. Yeah. And it, and it also it also fits one of the one of the sort of key things that really interests me and fascinates me about myth the fact that you know there is that space for for people um for people's special interests right okay um there is there is that there is that that space um and so you know and so there are people who will you know fall in love with um the figure of heracles for example and you know love listing his labors so you've got the 12 labors um then you've got the all the all the, the many 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 other um activities of, of Hercules that you could also you could also list um so everything you've said there that makes that makes sense that 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 resonates it fits with the categorization so to speak yeah, yeah no, definitely 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 and and also like the gods no i'm just i'm just thinking through the godzilla link because i've been mean, you know, thinking a lot about um godzilla uh lately um and um uh Another thing is um, what autistic people often like, um, particularly autistic children. Um, yeah, it's the it's the creatures, it's the beast, it's a fantastic beast, it's the it's the monsters. Um, and one thing that people often like doing is to sort of identify with the with the monsters. And so what so um, so one of the one of the things I'm focusing on the activities is is how yeah we can very much take a Hercules focus and think of him as the great adventurer who's got all these challenges to to face, including making this difficult choice. But you can also shift the focus. For example, you could shift the focus to how um, to how others are experiencing him. So it could be the two women on the chimney piece panel. Um, or it could be, for example, you know, the Hydra, because um, this could this could be this could be very much the Hydra story, you know, not least because um, here you have um, so you've got two two you know, men here who are out to defeat her, but you've also got her and her friend, the crab here, um, who are sort of trying to work together in order to save themselves, or to or to save the Hydra. Um, so um, so that the potential of looking at things from the creature's perspective as well is 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 really huge. And so so you know, why I paused from an after question was like I've been thinking about Godzilla. There's something in the air at the moment. So that that's really fascinating. And I I'd love to find out more about your son's interest if you'd like to discuss that. That would be yeah, of course. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. Um, I'll ping you a message in uh, shortly. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I think I'm not sure I, how this thing works. Um. Yeah. If if so, I put my yeah. I think um I think at the start I put my email address in the in the chat. Or did I? That might have been in Warsaw this morning. Um, I could do it right now. Um, or um, so so I, I might be repeating, but nobody cares. Um, or um, or uh, Amy will how to get hold of me. I put that on. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes when people guess it, they do Susan.dc because um, um, people who've been at Roehampton less long than I have um, would be, you know, would be first name dot surname, but I've been here so long, I'm just like first initial. <laughs> um, so um, Sonia is Sonia.nevin. <laughs> I'm just S.dc. Um, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Problem. Thank you. Oh, hi, Susan. I'm Claudina. Hi, it was lovely listening to oh. you again. Hi, um, I really enjoyed it, and I, I just wanted to to add up to your experience uh, with myths uh, among autistic children, because at the Your Museum we're also the local branch of the Young Archaeologists Club, and we do have a few members within the autistic spectrum. And um, the other day, uh, Amy was delivering one of the sessions and it was about Troy and all the myths surrounding Troy. And we were focusing on Helen. And I don't know why I came up with a question uh, to the kids. Uh, was Helen going with Paris willingly or unwillingly? So again, here we have a, a bit of a crossroad, a bit of a, a decision to make. A decision, yeah. 
and it was very interesting because uh, the only girl in the club uh, who, who was also autistic uh, was the only one uh, to deliver an answer. So I, I think that was a bit of uh, transactional between uh, autistic uh, children and gender issues because she was kind of well, if you're a girl and you're told to do something, uh, you would do it. Perhaps if you were a boy, you wouldn't because you would be more rebellious. And that kind of answer sort of blew my mind uh, to the degree that they can reach when elaborating about their own decisions. Mm -hmm. And I was, wonder, I was wondering if you faced that kind of feedback too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like so far, um, rather like with your session, um, most of the most of the children I've worked with have been have been boys rather than girls. Um, but th th so, uh, some of the um, comments from the boys have been um, really really interesting. And it was a boy, for example, who said that um, it was the, the women want to kiss Hercules, they want to marry Hercules. So something really so there's something really interesting going on there. Um, and uh, one, of, one of the things I have spoken about previously and, and, and want to do some more work, work on is girls and autism. Um, there is such a huge issue here, including um, how um, it's, it's so often the case that fewer girls will be in an autistic classroom, etc. Um, it doesn't mean there are fewer autistic um, women and girls out there. It's more it's more the case that for a long time, um, girls weren't being diagnosed, not helped by the fact that autistic um, the autistic brain was seen as a very masculine brain. OK, that's that, that's really, really interesting. Um, um, the other issue here is that um, and this is something I want to look into further. It's that um, uh, autistic girls are very often very, very skilled at masking their autism. Um, and it can be a source of, you know, huge anxiety and, and, and stress for them because they're always like working so very hard to seem like everyone else and to, and to fit in in a way that it can be more sort of acceptable for a, for a boy um, not to. Um, so the way in which um, Hercules is someone who's trying to fit in, right, who's always trying to fit in to a particular scenario is something that may well speak to an autistic, autistic girl's um, experience. Um, so the girls that I have worked with have certainly engaged very much with the um, with the with the activities. I have to say, I haven't so far, um, but like I said I have worked with more boys and girls. I haven't actually noticed um, uh, a gender um, division here, um, okay. which which was which was really interesting. So um, so I suppose my answer is I'm I'm very very much interested in autism and girls. I mean, and, and including for example via um, Thanks to you know various bits of research, including what um, Alice Alice Rowe Alice Rowe does and her her um, it, and how she's very reflective on what it what it is to be someone who's um, who's only um, diagnosed as autistic as a as an adult quite early in adulthood, but an adult nonetheless, and how then suddenly the whole of her her childhood and the various strategies she she would develop for like dealing with the world suddenly made um, so much more so much more sense. Um, so I have thought about autism and, and, and girls, but I've got a lot more. I've got there's a lot more I want to do here. OK, thank you. Apologies, Susan, that um, when someone tried to telephone me, I just got knocked out of Teams. Um, so I oh. missed a little bit in the middle there. But um, we uh, yeah, I th think um, things seem to have been going quite well. I'm, I'm, I've also missed out on whether there's anyone else there with a question um, that they might want to ask. Um, you do have, I mean, much of your work, direct work with people um, who have autism, have been diagnosed with autism is in the UK, but you've also worked on this project with an international team, including Poland. Um, do you, have you found any um, international distinctions between approaches to autism? Oh, you know, that is such an interesting question because that's another that's another huge issue and that's made being able to liaise with people thanks to <laughs> thanks to the pandemic <laughs> all over the world that's made it absolutely that's made it absolutely absolutely fascinating um so um so i i'm very aware that the provision for autistic people varies very much from um country to country i've even had you know comments from people I, i've worked with from some countries say oh no we don't have anything <laughs> you know, we don't have anything like that where, where we're from i think you just do i think people you know are just uh 
uh, you know, are, are very skilled at um, covering up their, their autism or perhaps, mm. yeah. Um, get diagnosed with, with with other things, which is really really interesting. So they're, de they're definitely you know there is definitely different provision um, in different countries um, and different perceptions of, of what it is to be um, autistic. Um, one of the things I've been struck by is that um, in a, in a lot of um, in a lot of countries, and I've talked really really um, interestingly with um, um, the um, well with with someone in um, in in Poland who's very involved with. Um, supporting young adults and adults who are autistic is that there is there is support um, when people are ch children um, but then unless um, there's family support available um, when they um, move to adulthood things can be very hard for an, auti an autistic adult so that's sort of, that's that's one of, so I've been I, I've been struck there's a lot of support um, for autistic children in a lot of places, it's then when they start transitioning away from uh, childhood that things might become um, really um, difficult. But one, but one thing that, but I've been um, um, including in the year since I've been doing the blog, um, I've been reached out to by people um, from various places um, who've done things like offered to, you know, consider um, trialing uh, or you know trying out um, the activities in their classrooms, and they can see and they can see the relevance. So I'm hoping that. Um, uh, a teacher in, in Greece is going to be able to do that, for instance, and Effie as well, if she could do that where she's currently working in Greece, that would be amazing. That's something we've been we've been discussing. Um, um, uh, there's been a really interesting sort of co-action uh, between myself and um, fellow people on the Our Mythical Childhood project in, in Israel. Um, so Lisa Morris at Bari Lam has the sort of parallel role there that I have I have here. And what happened was something really interesting is that she um, and her colleague Ayelet Peer, who um, also very much is involved in the Unmythical Childhood Project, um, they got interested in what I was doing in relation to Hercules and working with autistic children. So they have devised um, a set of lessons very much um, in collaboration with someone from the um, Israeli um, Autism Society, so the sort of Israeli you know, parallel organisation for the National Autistic Society in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and together with him, they have um, developed a, a set of lessons. Um, so far, I think they, they, they've been, um, particularly ILA has, has been going into schools and, and running the activities very much with, with teachers. But I think it's designed very much as something that you know, could, could be done without her. Um, so, what, so one thing that's really interesting here is it, so it started off with what I was doing. And then that led Ayelet and um, Lisa to um, develop their own activities, hence the idea um, for the Acclaim Network, for instance. Um, but because the, the, the way in which they sort of focus their activities has then it has then fed in turn into what I'm doing. Um, and so in ways that I probably can't even necessarily put my finger on in detail, um, what's been done in, in Israel is impacting on, on, on what I'm doing. And that's something we want very much to think about further, including um, for a panel that myself, Ayelet and Lisa and their colleague, um, whose name is just currently escaping me, from the Israeli um, Autism Society are going to be involved in. Uh, it was going to it was going to take place in person last year, <laughs> actually in Israel. Um, it's going to take place in a in a blended way, where um, the people in Israel can be in person for the most part, um, but people like me who were going to fly out um, will be doing it um, by a good old Zoom or whatever. But we will at least have that opportunity to for that co action. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, so thinking about things from um, from an international um, perspective is, is going to be a really is going to be a really interesting one. Um, I ran an activity for um, uh, the, this year's uh, not this year's but the, the last year's. Um, no, no, hang on, where are we? Um, for the most for the most recent, yeah, the, okay, this current academic year's um, being human festival. I think it was in October October or November 2020. Um, and what I did was a Hercules cafe, right? It's an online thing pitched at autistic children and their families. Um, late afternoon started at this kind of time so that people could do it after school potentially. Um, and, um, and, and whereas, you know, when you do being human things 
um, in person, then obviously it's, it's restricted to um, people who can travel to that particular um, locality. Um, but as we were able to do it via Zoom, you know, anybody who wanted to could come. And, and people did come from various places. We had someone from Australia, I think um, 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 definitely United States, uh, Australia, also um, Belgium, for instance. And, and the interesting thing here is I was getting a sense from people from um, a range of different places that um, what I was doing was resonating with, you know, their own experiences, um, including their experiences um, with, um, for example, you know, autistic um, family members. Um, so, um, uh, so you know, if there's anybody, if there's anybody here who has, you know, a, 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 an international perspective or any perspective, you know, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to hear from you. Okay. Anyway, so. Um, I hope that was an okay answer to the to the question. Yeah. Very interesting. I'm sorry to say, I think um, most of the people um, from abroad who joined the meeting have disappeared now. Oh. Although Maria Cecilia from um, from Brazil, if you're still out there, <laughs> it might be interesting to hear from you if you have an, a, a, an additional perspective. Not to call on anyone in particular in the audience, but. Actually, one thing I'm one thing I'm thinking of doing actually is um well um for another organisation <laughs> I'm involved in um which is um a network for people interested in teaching and learning ancient religion what we've decided to what we've decided to do um is um actually start you know get to get, have a, have an informal meeting where we try to be as um or we'll try to have as people from as many different countries as possible basically where we talk about how um how we've we've needed to do. Or have done um, ancient religion teaching differently thanks to COVID, and how far you know what we've done during COVID can then feed into what we go on to do afterwards, right? Um, so lessons we've learned in, in good ways, etc. Um, so one of the things I'm I'm just thinking of doing, having done this and having and also having run various kind of show and tell activities, um, where people you know anybody can come wherever they are as long as they don't mind you know coming in um, during uh, at a time. Of, uh, it's harder for people in Australia, I suppose, and New Zealand because the time zones, yeah. But it has happened. Um, so, um, so it'd be really, it'd be really interesting um, opportunity, I think, um, to um, have a meeting of people from as many different parts of the world as as, as possible, um, where we all get together and you know, and and, and talk about issues relevant to um, autism and teaching autistic children and how mythology might play a role role here. Um, very much, um, you know, thinking about it in relation to our own um, our own context, and that would have a really good fit in any case with the Our Mythical Childhood project. If I'm still if I'm still sharing the screen, um, the um, the full title is Our Mythical Childhood dot 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 um, the reception of classical antiquity in children's and young adult culture in response to regional and global challenges. So there's always been um, a regional focus and a global focus. So we've got particular um, sort of like wings of the project based in the UK, in Poland, in Israel, in Australia and in Cameroon. Um, and we also have, you know, various people who are very involved in the project from other countries as well. So there's there's from the very inception been a been a, um, an interest in in um, uh, international uh, in global issues, but also very much regional ones. So um, something where we think about um, how um, we, we experience issues relating to autism differently or indeed in the same way um, in different countries would be something I very much like to do. And one space for that would be the conference that and one of the other placements, the other placement students, Erica, um, is coordinating to, um, to run um, next month at the end of May. There's already going to be input from people interested in um, autism at Roehampton and also from a centre that's recently been set, set up in Warsaw uh, on autism education. So there'll already be an opportunity for UK practitioners and Warsaw practitioners um, to speak to one another. But it'd be really nice. And I'm hoping to bring in as many people from Israel as well, for example. Um, and once we start advertising that in earnest, hopefully from other places as well. Um, so, um, so but yeah, these are, these are just a few a few initial thoughts. Um, and um, there's so much more that um, you know I think we can um, find out here and learn from one another about. Well, lots of work yet to be done. Yes, yeah, thank you. I've learned a 
I've learned so much. I mean, in the years since I've been, I've started getting interested in autism. Um, what autism is viewed as has changed so absolutely hugely, um, and it's continuing to. And it's so it's 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 very it's a very oh god it's a very very exciting, <laughs> um, it's very very exciting to be to be doing this. And um, you know, thank you for um, you know listening to me and um, sharing your your views, including in the chat here, which is so exciting. Thank, thank you for coming and sharing your experience and your views. And actually, what you've just um, talking about the international thing, um, there's a lot of overlap, um, also with what some of our other speakers actually might be might be talking about. And I'm delighted to say that two of our four other speakers were here today. Oh. Um, Arlene and Ellen. Um, who's going to talk? To, Arlene's going to uh, talk to us. Um, Arlene Holmes Henderson on the 12th of May. I've tried to share a, the poster of, of this whole series, Making Classics Better. Um, and then we've got um, Ellen Adams from King's on the 19th of May, Disability Studies and the Classical Body of Scott and Other. Um, but next week, I hope um, everyone will come um, join us um, talking about people coming from Australia. Louise Hitchcock, bless her, in Melbourne. There was some lecture she gave um, a few months ago, and I and I really wanted to wake up at like one o'clock in the morning to hear her lecture. And I reached out to her and I said, could you just come to us in Reading? And tried to offer her a different time. time. And she said, no, no, no. She's very happy to come um, late, late at night or early in the morning or whatever it is. But anyway, on, on something that um, obviously you've touched on a little bit, uh, COVID. And in this case, COVID and collapse. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, I hope um, everyone else will... Um, uh, be um, joining me to thank you so much again with virtual claps, real claps, whatever it is, and a, a cup of tea or wine as the, as the case may be, but um, speed you on your way to go help your daughter with her rugby career. Oh yeah, I have to, I have to go now, don't I? Yeah, for that, yeah. <laughs> so I, yeah, <laughs> I shared something with you. Yeah, so yeah, I had, so I had to get to Guildford now, to Stoke Park. Okay, so thank you so much. And, and do come back for one of our other talks later. Yes, yeah, yeah, no, no, I absolutely plan to. No, this is, this is amazing. So thank you, thank you, thank you for it, everyone. Um, thank you, Amy. <laughs> okay, bye-bye.